you know, there's some ingredients that you can't get in the UK unless you have a license, unless you're certified, like quinine hydrochloride, which goes into the bitter flavor that goes into tonic. It's highly poisonous, but you can get anything you want from Alibaba in China. So I started importing <laughs> white powder from um, from China, and these unmarked box of white powder used to come to my house. My wife's like, what are you doing? What is this? <laughs> you're gonna get us deported. Like, Don't worry, it'll, 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 it'll be fine. Hi, hi, Lono Nation, and welcome to this week's conversation on the Lono Drinker podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce to you Mr. Avnish Babla, the founder behind Savile Beverage Company. Uh, the brand was founded in 2019 to be a sophisticated adult non-alcoholic beverage for people to enjoy to, and I quote, celebrate the occasions where we can all be together, no matter where you are or what you're drinking. Uh, Savile cocktails are classic, chic and convenient and today I want to know more about the man behind the brand, the story that led him to where he is um, and we'll also touch on a few topics that I don't often get to talk about here on the podcast such as how we can uh, increase diversity for everybody in the low no space. So grab a drink, settle down and say hello to Avnish. How are you doing today Avnish? Um, Good Denise, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. It's lovely to um, finally have you on for a chat. I know we met briefly about a month or so ago at the summit, which was a huge, huge event for our industry. And perhaps we'll touch on that again a bit later. Um, But I've wanted to have you on the podcast. You've been top of my list for a while because I Mm -hmm. I love the brand. I love the branding. um, And I think you make a fantastic drink. So I always like to start by asking my guests to sort of share their story with Low No Nation. So start where you'd like to start. What's your journey that mm-hmm. led you to where you are today? Yeah, so I can start with a bit of my background. So I was born in the UK, but grew up in Canada. Um, and just working early career was in consulting, working in banking um, all over North America, um, working with the big banks in the US uh, across Canada. Um, and my wife, when she found out I was British, she's always trying to push me to move, move, move back to the UK. I'm like, why do you want to move back to the UK? Everyone wants to go to Canada or the US, do the other thing. But um, you know, she eventually broke me down <laughs> and we moved here. <laughs> we moved to the UK, moved to London 10 years ago, uh, a little over 10 years ago. And I think one of the social aspects that we recognized in the UK versus the US or Canada is that the drinking culture is just stark vastly different here uh, very very different in north america you kind of drink for the weekends thursday friday saturday if there's a football game you know american football okay. you drink on sunday here in the uk it's just it's all day every day it's not uncommon to find people at the pub 10 a.m on a monday morning having a pint or so uh and we were very much part of the lifestyle you know new to london we love the gastronomy scene we love going out and just celebrating and and having a good time that often came with an overindulgence on alcohol um and also just working in in the city it, it comes with the, the territory to your company dinners team events everything just ends up at the pub even if you play sports you're trying to keep healthy i play ice hockey still play football back in the day and you know just you always end up at the pub and um you know, there was a there's a point probably about six years ago we wanted to start a family and we said we'll live kind of more healthier lifestyles and cutting out alcohol was, was one of the kind of our goals of living that lifestyle um my wife had a very easy time cutting out alcohol i just i had a very difficult time just because you know the nature of, of where i was working you know i loved having a gin and tonic at every night you know i loved going out to the bar with friends or to the, the pub with friends and enjoying that social atmosphere but there there wasn't really anything there weren't any alternatives back there. Sea lip was just coming onto the scene. Um, it was something new. I wasn't really aware of it. I tried it. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the flavors were, were okay. Some, some were, I love, but some were not so great. But aside from that, there, there weren't very many options. Um, but this idea that kind of got implanted in my head when um, I was on a trip with my wife to the Middle East and we were on the British Airways flight and there's a High Life magazine in in back seat, and there's an article about Ben Branson and his journey. This is probably like 2017, and that kind of sparked this idea. I said, you know, this is a fantastic idea. What he's done for spirits, has anybody done it for cocktails? And you know, mocktails have been around for a long time, but no one's really premiumized that space and kind of taken it to the next level and created something really elevated. So this idea was just in my head all all the time I was out in, in the Middle East, kind of how can I do this, you know, researching nonstop. Uh, and then I came back to London and just started 
experimenting in the kitchen, um, just having fun with it. I love making cocktails for friends and, and family at home. They also really uh, adapt at mixing different ingredients and making some really great alcoholic cocktails. So for me, it was a kind of a curiosity. Could I recreate the flavors of popular cocktails, but with, without the alcohol? Uh, my wife was working in Sweden at the time. She was there three, four days a week. So I had a lot of free time on my hands. We didn't have kids at that point. So a lot of free time on my hands, <laughs> just having fun. Um, I was I bought a copper still at one point in my kitchen, which apparently is illegal. You can't have that in your kitchen and just buying ingredients wherever I could and just mixing and matching. You know, there's some ingredients that you can't get in the UK unless you have a license, unless you're certified, uh, a certified kitchen like quinin hydrochloride, which goes into the bitter flavor that goes into tonic is highly poisonous, but you can get anything you want from Alibaba in China. So I started importing <laughs> white powder from um from china and um, these unmarked blocks of white powder used to come to my house my wife's like what are you doing what is this you know you're gonna get us deported oh, don't worry it'll 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 be fine it's gonna be but fine. there's a yeah, it'll be okay just yeah relax it'll pay off soon uh but yeah there's a lot of different ingredients in our drinks that you know i took some time to really curate and find what works what doesn't work you know like the ginger flavors in, in our drinks. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of ways you can go about it. Um, kind of that that warmth that you get from alcohol. I was trying to recreate recreate, recreate that in many ways as possible. I tried things like uh, I don't know, buzz buttons, these like little tingly, tingly flowers. These flowers that give you a little tingle on the tip of your tongue, um, like electric buzz on the tip of your tongue. They're like Szechuan peppers that you get in hot pot that gives you that, that nice numbness, all these random things. Um, what we found is a lot of brands like to use uh, capsaicin or cayenne pepper, which gives you a very sharp heat on the tip of your tongue, quite unpleasant. Um, I've tried a lot of different things. Um, there's one ingredient I got, which was uh, capsaicin extract. Um, you're familiar with the Scoville units, uh, Scoville yes. scale? Yeah, like it's habanero peppers are 100,000. Yeah, like Carolina Reaper, one of the hottest is, I think, 1.5 million. You can get these little extract crystals from the internet right. that are 16 million Scoville units. I mean, they come what? in like a locked case and everything. So I put one little crystal in a two liter bottle of water and had a sip and I was, I was on the floor. I was like, I was, <laughs> my <laughs> eyes were watering, my face was just red, oh extremely dangerous. Yeah, so there's a lot of personal pain went into developing these drinks, but you know, I found some nice extracts, some nice uh, more pepper-based extracts that gives you a bit more warmth in the back of your throat. And so it gives you a bit more of evolution of, of the flavor. So I developed these drinks over the course of 12 months in my kitchen, um, myself, probably 12 different different types of drinks just based on drinks that I like, like an old Cuban, my favorite alcoholic cocktail. So we created a version of that, Spice Rum and Cola, Moscow Mules, Bellinis, all of it. Um, and then we wanted to refine the brand as well because what I found is that mocktails tend to be very bright, bold, and sugary. I wanted to create a mm -hmm. brand that was very classy, very sophisticated, more drier flavors, natural ingredients, so nothing artificial um, in there, trying to keep as clean as possible. So we engaged the help of a commercial kitchen in, throughout 2019 to refine the recipes, commercialize them, um, make sure they're safe. No one's passed out on the floor uh, <laughs> like I was. And uh, yeah, we, we developed the brand as well throughout 2019, uh, left my job late 2019 and launched January 2020 officially. Yeah, the worst, the worst time to launch a business. We just had a baby at that point as well. Oh worst God. time to launch a business. But, uh, you know, a couple months later, the world shut down. And I can yeah. talk about the journey through there. But that was kind of the the start of it is yeah, more out of, out of curiosity to see, could I create something for friends and family that was really unique and, and different? Wow, that's quite a journey. There's, I've, I've made loads of notes while you're talking there because there's so many things <laughs> that I wanted to, to pick up on. First of all, are you okay now after that, uh, yeah. that, that pepper in the water? <laughs> Completely fine. <laughs> that's, uh, that's quite, I love that you've put so much um, personal time and effort into researching these ingredients because whilst you have worked with people that can help you to develop these recipes, um, it's nice when you hear that a founder has actually been hands-on from the very beginning, you know, sitting in your kitchen at your table, you know, I've got mm -hmm. visions of you with pots bubbling over in one corner and vessels on the other <laughs> side and just sort of like alchemy going on to, yeah it was like a high school great. laboratory it was it's great <laughs> i still have all that stuff somewhere it's uh, yeah, yeah the bunsen burners the beakers everything <laughs> that's fantastic that's fantastic. um 
that you mentioned um, a word there that, that I wasn't planning on asking you this, but uh, you, you mentioned it a couple of times. So I just want to get your thoughts on it. I recently put out a, an article on my LinkedIn newsletter and a, and a post about the word mocktails. Now, you mm-hmm. use that word a couple of times there as well. And I find that it's one of the, the, the great debates within the low no space. In fact, <clears throat> at the uh, summit that, that you and I met at, I was part of a conversation with a group of, of professionals in the low no space and it was really interesting listening to them about the use of the word mocktails now your drinks are obviously ready-made cocktails they're rtds ready to drinks in cans for people to pop and pour and Mm -hmm. go Uh, they are non-alcoholic cocktails and as such they are referred to as mocktails by some but other people find that they think that that word is um derogatory to the category or that it takes something away from the drinks that are made Mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on the word well, I think mocktails for me and why we've kind of strayed away from the word mocktails, mocktails to me has that connotation of very sugary drinks, just juices as an alternative to um, alcohol, but pretty much just juice and sugar. They don't really recreate the flavors of, of cocktails. Um, you know, there are a lot of brands out there that have done this for, for a number of years, dozens of years, and it hasn't evolved. Um, what I find, what I feel is that non-alcoholic cocktails are an evolution of the mocktail. So a more mature um, flavor profile, a lot more quality ingredients that go in there, a lot less sugar, healthier ingredients. So it is a similar product, but yeah, I would say more of an evolution to a mocktail. And that's why we want to distance ourselves from that name. But, you know, it's recognizable. People see the name and they think mocktail. So I'm not opposed to it because it brings people into the category, especially out in the U.S. where mocktail is is a really big, big word and is driving that category. And, you know, they're they're interchangeable. So it's just, I think it's, it's, part and parcel of the same same product just we'd like to think of ours as more premium mocktails and we dis- yeah. distinguish them by calling them non-alcoholic cocktails yeah yeah absolutely i think you, your, your point there about it bringing people into the category and people understand what the word means in terms and in so much as they know it's going to be a cocktail that doesn't have alcohol in it mm-hmm. um and I, I think you know we've got to be careful as 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 voices in our space that we don't alienate people by saying that you know you can't use that word because it's it's not cool essentially is what the mm-hmm. conversation is um but i also on the flip side understand that the drinks that producers like yourself are making are not this sugary fruity layered colorful drink that first pops to mind when you use the word mocktails you know i'm thinking umbrellas and mm-hmm. swirly straws <laughs> <laughs> um i think um you mentioned there uh, in America and, and what it's like, sort of uh, the, the community over there and them understanding the use of these drinks. I know that when we last spoke, you'd mentioned that you're spending a lot of time going back and forth between here and the States at the moment. How are you finding that then? Because you're doing fantastically well over here and, and we will talk more about you know where we can find you. You've made your way into some amazing stores and retailers that people will recognize your brand in. When you're trying to do that in America, what kind of um, reception are you finding that you're getting over there? Because it's a different beast, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Yeah, the landscape is completely different. You probably heard this a hundred times. You know, every state is like its own country. Regulation is different. Consumer trends are different. Um, I think what we find over there, there are dozens and dozens of non-alcoholic cocktail or mocktail brands out there. The, comp- the competition is, is really fierce. Um, yeah. But what we find out there is, I guess, we have a bit of a cost advantage in in the UK in that we have access to really high quality flavor houses, you know, juice manufacturers, um, production facilities that are fairly cost effective. So we can produce a higher quality, a better tasting product um, than what you can find out there at the same price point. I think that's really distinguishing us and probably a few other um, UK based brands uh, when it comes to what's available on shelf out in the US. Um, in the US, we also find because perhaps, you know, the lack of availability of really high quality flavors, uh, a lot of brands are not really trying to recreate the flavors of cocktails, which is we're very open that that's what we are doing. Um, yeah. A lot of brands in the US are using additives, you know, functional ingredients, trying to add that little extra edge. To, to their brand um, to deliver a bit more than just flavor. Um, you know, brands like Kin and, and uh, a few others like that. Um, 
which yeah, which is great. It, it adds to the overall uh, category and options available for consumers. But it's not what we're we're about. And in terms of brands that are doing what we're doing, I think we're able to set ourselves apart because of the access to to the ingredients that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that. <clears throat> Often when I've spoken to uh, producers about America, you're right, they, they do uh, have mentioned the fact that it's it's so it's a different challenge over there because, as you say, it's not like here in the UK where you have a, a centralised supplier or, or, or two that might send your product out to different places. Each state has a different set of rules. So, you know, I can imagine that for an independent brand trying to learn to navigate that must be quite a mm-hmm. daunting task because you don't have the might of a Diageo behind you or, or Heineken to sort of say, right, mm-hmm. okay, we've got all these ins, you know, to start making yeah. those conversations across state lines. Yeah, how do there, you begin? there are a lot of complexities, not just around distribution, but even how retailers are categorizing um, products like ours and the three-tier system, three-tier alcohol system. Some retailers, you know, have to strictly abide by that system. That limits how many states you can you can sell into. You know, one retailer we work with, and we're expanding our footprint into. Um, depending on the state, we're openly able to to sell our products. But in other states, unless they have a license for um, alcohol, we're not able to sell our products into that into that location because we're considered part of the BWS set. The beer, wine, and spirit set. Um, even though we're non-alcoholic, we fall under that categorization. And without that alcohol distribution license, we can't sell into those states. Even though it's the same, it's the same retailer across lines, across states. Other retailers, we, you know, we're we're across country in about three hundred locations at one of our retailers, Sprouts, and they're freely open to to distribute into almost every state. So it's a mixed bag um, out there. It's quite complex, and we do take it state yeah. by state. Wow. Wow. That sounds like a, a huge under, undertaking. Um, let's bring it back to the drinks themselves, because we haven't mm-hmm. told people what's in your uh, fantastic range. Now, uh, those who are watching our video can see a beautiful display behind me. Um, but I wonder if you could take us through the drinks that are in the range, Avnish. And also, yeah. you've had some iterations, haven't you? Because I've seen that you previously had you had different range. You mentioned beforehand as well. You did a, a rum and cola style. Mm-hmm. Uh, you were in glass bottle for a while and now you're in can. So take us through the range and the journey that those drinks themselves been, have been on yeah so i think that the range and the evolution comes from my naivety as an entrepreneur it's my first entrepreneurial venture um so you know you're very ambitious when you first launch you want to take over the world you want to deliver everything um so i developed 12 recipes <laughs> and then we refined six of them and wow. the advice that i was told was launch with three just start with three and i said no i know what i'm doing i'm going to start with six um so we we had our core rangers is a bellini mojito we had the moscow mule paloma um, old cuban spice rum and cola and a whiskey sour really great uh, we had them in 250 ml bottles so i wanted to start with really nice premium glass bottles when we launched just no one else was doing that and it's really unique i don't know if you've seen them before i don't i don't think i have any available right now but they're kind of tall body with a short neck, so they kind of look like a liquor bottle, uh, but they're really small, uh, 250 mil. Yeah, they're beautiful. Looks fantastic, looks great, crown, crown, copper crown cap and everything, mm-hmm. but all, no one could produce with them. They're just so difficult because they're very top heavy, so it was very hard to find a manufacturer that could produce that type of, in that type of bottle. We had one manufacturer that we worked with, the, and we did our pilot, you know, invested a lot of money into the, into the pilot, getting everything perfect. And um, the very first run, the bottle started exploding on the line, just like pop, pop, pop. And it was because they weren't used to working with that bottle. Um, they couldn't, the bottle couldn't handle the carbonation in, in that neck. And we lost you know, 20,000 pounds. It was my, I didn't have any product, but 20,000 pounds just gone um, in our first run. So not a, good, not a good way to start. Yeah, not a good way to start uh, this new venture. Um, but there are challenges that you learn. So... We stuck with that bottle. We stuck yeah, with, yeah. so I stuck with six. I think it gave us a really good entry into the category, kind of a big splash into into the category. People recognized us, really great range of flavors. I wanted to create, because we're a brand that's about inclusivity and, and diversity, I wanted to create flavors for everyone. So, you know, if you don't enjoy uh, Prosecco or if you don't enjoy vodka, we have something in our range for you. And I think I, I took it maybe a bit too far and creating too many. And it's just logistically is, is such a big challenge to manage because some sell really well, others don't sell as much. And you just have difficulty trying to balance the, the inventory 
um, especially when you're young and you know your COVID happens and there's so much irregularity that happened through COVID uncertainty that happened. Uh, so then we moved to cans. We kind of had both cans and bottles uh, after our first year, and we started with the Bellini. So this is a the Bellini, which is a nice peach and prosecco flavor. So it's our alternative to a champagne. It's really nice ripe peach flavors, effervescent aromatic peach with um, dry kind of white wine finish to it. Really great for Sunday brunches, um, weddings. We do a lot of weddings with that. Even corporate events where you have a reception dinner and yeah. guests are offered either a champagne or a non-alcoholic alternative. And we found a lot of guests, when they're offered something that's non-alcoholic, they'll opt to take it, especially at the first drink of the night. It's just kind of availability and visibility is key in this category. So we find that works really well um, for big events. And then we have a traditional um, Hito, mint, lime, and rum, just very dry, crisp. It's, it's very difficult to get that fresh mint taste. We probably went through a hundred different mint extracts to get it right. And we're using, we're using like other flavors to give you that bit of a nose of mint. Um, so our, our drinks are quite complex in the number of ingredients that we have in there. We probably have about 10 to 12 ingredients per uh, per drink, per flavor. And then we have the... And I will, I will uh, jump in and say that the mints mm -hmm. really did come through on the um, on the mojito because yeah. it's, it's quite a tricky flavor, I think, because mint is quite... It's delicate, but you know it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I poured it into my glass and it hit me on the nose, I was like, yes, that's what you want. Yeah, that's that fresh mint, right, that you get in the bar. Then we have a yeah. grapefruit Paloma. So this is a tequila flavoring with bittersweet pink grapefruit. Just really nice, really different. Again, not too sweet, effervescent. And then my favorite is the ginger, the Moscow Mule. So this is the fiery ginger with a hint of mint lime and has a vodka essence squad is vodka essence but it's a subtle flavor that you have that you you have in there and that won a double gold at the san francisco spirit competition last year never heard of a double gold before but we got it and it was the highest rated non alcoholic cocktail in last year's competition so it's really really great uh, great range so that's our, our core range we have new products in development uh, as well that we're looking to launch shortly or bring back one of the other recipes that we have um in our toolkit okay I was going to say, the Moscow Mule really does pack a punch. That mm -hmm. is ginger at its finest in there. Because, I, again, I tasted <laughs> that one and I was like, oh, yeah, that's it. That you know you've got mm -hmm. some real ginger going on in there. Yeah, it's trying to find that balance. You know, you, you have customers who yeah. like something fiery, but maybe it's too much for them. Um, or some people want more. So you're trying to find that you're going to tweak over the, the, the years. And that's kind of the benefit of being a small company. You can quickly iterate your recipes and, and refine them. Yeah, and then and, we and have. You, know, you, you can't please all the people all the time, can mm -hmm. you? You have to provide what you think is the best quality drink that you can make, uh, mm -hmm. and, and hope that the people that you're trying to reach can appreciate the nuances and and you know what you're trying to create within that. But nobody likes everything, and that's perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then you know, as we as we branch into retail, we wanted to create some nice, exciting packaging. So we recently launched these. Mm -hmm. well, these launched early last year. And that's what's really gotten it's just a lot of uh, recognition in the UK and the US. Every box you can see some behind me. Um, it's really pop out on shelf. Um, these are four cam packs that are available at Sainsbury's, um, a number of retailers in the US, online, Amazon. Um, but a great way to, we have a, the four can mix pack here. This is the one that's sold in Sainsbury. So you have one of every flavor in there. And what we find in this space, it's still a new nascent category. People are still exploring. They're trying to understand what they like, what they don't like. So with the mixed flavor pack, it's a great entryway into non-alc at a fairly, that's eight pounds, you know, fairly low cost. You don't have to buy a 30 pound bottle of spirit and all the mixers and everything else and try to mix it yourself. This gives you four really great flavors and you can choose what you like and then you can move on to a full uh, a full flavor pack um, after that. Yeah, I think the the mix pack is a great idea. Um, not least of all because you don't always just want twelve of the same thing. You know, especially mm -hmm. if it's something like a cocktail that you're taking in a can to perhaps to a party or to a picnic or just round to a friend's house. You want to be able to mix up the drinks that you're having of an evening time, and to be able to compare with your friends and say, you know, oh, you try this one, I'll, I'll have that one. So I think that's a great idea. And then people can then go to your website, I presume, and then. Once they've decided on their favorites, they can then purchase multiples. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and we're and finding what that is trend. That for those that want to go and check it out. 
Oh, it's Savile.com. Yeah, check it out, Savile.com. Or you can find us on Amazon. We're on Acado as well in the UK. We're, we're in Whole Foods um, and a lot of independent sites. So really good good distribution throughout the UK. Yeah, and I think that's fantastic that you've, you're you in so many accessible places as well. And being on the shelves in Sainsbury's is, I know, a, a dream for many uh, independents that I speak to. You know, they, they want to make it onto the, the big supermarket shelves. Mm-hmm. Uh, having spoken to to other founders, I know that it's not necessarily the uh, the the non alcoholic nirvana that people might be hoping that it is, mm-hmm. um, and it still poses some challenges. So, what what sort of challenges are you still finding? Even though you're now so front and center in somewhere like Sainsbury's, mm-hmm. are you still finding that you're fighting that sort of battle to? get that shelf space and get that recognition. Yeah, it's it's very, we were, we were fighting, you know, like everyone, we wanted to be in the big supermarkets right away and you, you knock on doors very early on. So we've been pushing for four years, three and a half, four years to get on shelf of one retailer, but it's baby steps. So, you know, we find the opportunity, some opportunities are just timing works out really well. Others are just grafting and, and working really hard. So we worked with a distributor early on and they had entry into Whole Foods, you know, the Whole Foods were looking at that time for non op cocktails, non op drinks. And we were proposed, they loved it. And we got on shelf in, in, in Whole Foods, which was, was fantastic. But there are also challenges when you're on shelf. Um, you know, their Whole Foods doesn't necessarily have a, a non op category, non op bay like the bigger retailers like Tesco or Sainsbury's have. So we are positioned in the alcohol section next to the RTD alcoholic cocktails, next to the hard seltzers. And, you know, it's just tough when you're against that crowd to kind of call out that you're in this corner we're, we're non alk you're in this corner come look at us um so that's been a bit of a, a challenge there but through that we're able to get into harrods you know we're able to get into a few other premium um retailers independent retailers and just kind of incrementally it grows uh, grows from there you know we launched into Ocado through the back of getting a listing with gorillas and then getting the distributor on board and then you can take it into a car so everything kind of happens in, in stages but the retail landscape the big retail has been quite tricky because non alk is, is still new um, what we found is a lot of the retailers they put more junior buyers into the category and where we sit the rtds fall into spirits into the spirits category so beer behemoth beer is a behemoth category so it's on its own we have wine and then you have spirits and underneath spirits you have non-alk spirits and then we kind of fall under the non-alk spirit category in terms of operations and and, and buyer logistics so um, there's not a lot of data in that category either um, you have data for non-alk spirits but particularly rtds very slim data because there's not a lot of products on shelf so trying to find that data and use it to prove that you know you can be better than what's on shelf is quite challenging and there isn't a lot on shelf. There's Gordon Zero Zero. Um, there are a couple of other brands like Funkin in in, um, in Tesco, and a couple of others. So you're against some really big, big brands, and you're saying, you know, I'm this little guy. Even though we're doing well in our other channels, you know, you might have one space open a year, and you have dozens and dozens of brands competing to get into that one space. And you have the big brands who want to launch NPDs, new products, you know, you have celebrities coming out with products and they get on shelf right away. So it's extremely crowded, um, a lot of noise in this space. So I think a lot of it has to come with down to persistence. Um, you know, these, these, as I mentioned, the junior buyers you work hard to establish a relationship, you know, showcase your product and then they're gone in six months and you have to start again. Uh, we found this just over and over and over again. So a bit of it is luck finding that buyer who's committed to the role and committed to your brand and kind of is your champion. And that's what we found at Sainsbury is really great set of buyers. You know, and we had other buyers from Whole Foods come into Sainsbury's, from Mikado come into Sainsbury's, and they internally were, were championing our, our brand as well. So everything kind of came together, which was you know fantastic. Again, the, the hard work and a, and a bit of luck came through. I know as an entrepreneur, you don't want to hear that. You know, other founders don't want to hear that it's a bit of luck, but truly it is. Um, sometimes you just catch a break and, and it works out in your favor. But you know what? I like the saying about uh, luck, which is that luck is where hard work meets opportunity. And it sounds mm-hmm. that that's just what's happened with you. You know, you've worked hard, you've pushed for this, you've, you've had the meetings, you've met the people, you've gone through the cycle time and time and time again until it just so happens that these things sort of came together at the right time with the right people for you that you were able mm-hmm. to take advantage 
of that hard work and that opportunity to get the luck that you refer to. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm an entrepreneur myself and it, you don't want to hear it. You just want to hear, oh, no, there's there's a great <laughs> way to do it. Just follow this short yeah. and everything will be fine. Mm -hmm. You'll be a millionaire this time next week. But yeah. sadly, it just doesn't work like that. And that's the issue with the non-elk um, space. There's there's no there's no playbook. There, there's there's no playbook for non-elk. It's not like you're introducing a new peanut butter or a new energy drink where there's tons of data available and you can say I can just incrementally make something a bit better. And there's there's routes into shelf that are established and maybe I can push my way in there. The non-elk space is continuously evolving. You know, spirits were big years ago with you know follow on seed lip beers have been massive and now you know those crap beers, the big brands, the non-elk cocktail space is far less refined um, there's no strategy of what works what doesn't work um, the big players have been on shelf for a while but those brands you know, gin and tonic a non og gin and tonic has gone quite stale and the retailers haven't really introduced new flavors so you know, we're coming and pushing okay. an eclectic array of, of flavors but yeah again there's no playbook on how it should be done and what works what doesn't work you kind of just have to try everything all the time and just keep pushing <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It is. We're at the start of something here, and, and you're building it as as you're going along. You know, so it. You're right. There is no playbook. There's no. This is how you do it. It's just you are the playbook for the brands that are going to be coming behind you, and they'll be looking at you, going, right. What did Avnish do? How did they do this? You know, can we 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 have the same success if we follow the patterns that they made? Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the the things that I think makes your brand stand out is that it's clearly a high quality brand. And I wanted to get your thoughts on premiumization within the low and no space. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your, your, your branding, the artwork that you use, the bottles that you discussed before, before they exploded, mm -hmm. uh, all, <laughs> and, and, and your can work as well, all very high end. Um, what are your thoughts on the sort of premiumization in low and no? Because now that the, the category has been established for a little bit of time, there seems to be a breakout of some brands trying to work towards a more, uh, you know, higher end clientele, perhaps, mm -hmm. as opposed to some who are going for sort of the everyday market. Mm -hmm. I think for us and a lot of brands, when we saw the success of Seedlip, we thought we could follow that model. You know, so when we launched in January 2020, our model was to go into high-end bars and restaurants uh, with our bottle. And they all said, no, you know, they're saturated with, um, bombarded with a lot of brands coming out at the time, trying to follow that, that similar model. Um, but we kept pushing on that front. Uh, but then COVID really kind of kicked this, kicked this in our pants and said, you know, you have to, to, to really have your business survive. You need to sell to the mass market. Um, you need to kind of, bring it down a couple of notches and make your product more accessible. And that's kind of why we went to cans versus bottles to bring down our, our price point, bring down our production costs, bring down our price point, make it more accessible, Keep, keeping the liquids the same. So the liquids, uh, we don't compromise on the liquids. We keep that the same, um, but making the product more accessible, but still premiumization comes through the branding and how it's represented, um, how we convey our brand in terms of social medias and, and engagement with our customers. Um, to get them into into the brand and get liquid on lips and once they mm -hmm. try it they absolutely know it. it's it's a premium product so we pushed on that angle for a number of years but i think the non alk space is still new it's still maturing so you know bars and restaurants they didn't really get it at that point that you know a mocktail can be a high quality product because to them mocktails are still juices you know ready to drink anything ready to drink at that point was still just sugar sugar water and juice um, so that's taken some time to evolve and what we're finding now is that vendors and, and bar managers are coming around and they value consistency of serve, convenience of serve, you know, cost of serve, but also high quality, something high quality that tastes like a prop cocktail that you can just pour. Um, so we're winning a lot of accounts uh, where they're serving a large number of customers really quickly, but then want something really premium and, and classy that you can serve in the can at the table or in, in the glass. Um, but I think we're also riding a wave of premiumization in alcoholic cocktails. You know, brands like Moth have come to the scene uh, and Tom Savano, who said you know, it's no longer a, a tinny, a gin in a tin type of proposition. You can have really high quality ingredients and have high quality products um, and it, it's going to cost you a little bit more. And we're seeing that spill over into the non alk RTD space and we're, we're, you know, we are that product that has chipped away at it for years. And now that messaging is coming through and we're pushing on that. And that's really 
differentiating us in the space. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to touch on a, a subject that I think I don't get often get the opp opportunity to talk to about. <clears throat> you have to excuse me. I've got a terrible frog in my throat. I'm recovering from a horrible flu. So excuse me if I stumble my words or sound a bit croaky. Um, yeah, so this is a topic I don't often have the opportunity to talk about on this show. Mm -hmm. um, but with people uh, who look like you and I, uh, there is a notable uh, difference in the amount of people within the low and no space on both sides, both consumers and producers, uh, in the sort of diversity that's around. Um, and I wanted to speak to you about that because um, a lot of people, when they produce a brand, they are solving a problem for themselves, which you, you did, uh, and those are the founders that have as much the most passion behind their brands. Um, but when I look at your marketing and the sort of perhaps the ladies on your boxes, mm -hmm. you look quite different from the people that we'll see perhaps mm -hmm. on your social media <laughs> or in your branding. Um, how do you navigate that on a personal level uh, in terms of entering this market that can be quite um, samey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as, as a new entrepreneur, um, I didn't know what to expect of how a founder needs to present themselves with the face of the brand. You know, I thought you could just do a good job in the background and your products will sell themselves. Um, you know, you just growing up, I've never been a big self promoter. Um, I've always been, you're just good at doing what I do and kind of get through it uh, throughout my career, uh, doing the same thing, but never really screaming and shouting about my accomplishments. I think for me, that's one of the biggest challenges of being a founder is I'm still not very good at it. I'm trying. Um, we have a lot of accolades and we do really well, but I'm not on LinkedIn all the time, posting every little uh, win or on social media. I think that's one one challenge uh, from my personal background. Um, it's just the self-promotion. If you are an entrepreneur, you just have to scream and shout because no one else is going to do it for you. Um, but in terms of the diversity, yeah, when I when I first launched into this, into this space, I was one of the only ethnic minority founders in, in the non-alc space. And even today, still one of the only few or handful of few. And you touched on it right there. A lot of the producers, you know, when you go to these events and the panel, you know, the, the investors, the producers, you know, the brand founders, you know, all of them, they're, they're, they're a certain, certain background. Um, and there's a visible uh, limitation on the ethnic diversity. It's not representative of the UK society. Um, and then you touched on consumers as well. We, as a brand that's about diversity and inclusivity, we actively target those who are from ethnic minority backgrounds because, you know, at Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, at Punjabi wedding, you'll get a bottle of Shavaz, you get whiskey on every table um, and, a, and a, bo a box of mango juice or some Coca-Cola. You know, if you're not drinking, you don't get anything special, you get sugar. Um, so for me, I started this brand to give really great alternatives to those who just don't have access, who have never been proposed alternatives by alcohol companies or soft drink companies. They just get the same thing all the time. So that was a big part of our, our, our marketing campaign was to push to these demographics. Um, you know, we were in Tasty Africa for a while, you know, the, the African uh, chain, food chain in, in London, and um, you know, it works really well, but you're not going to make a profitable business by doing that. Um, when it comes down to it, you know, it's, it's a small market and uh, a lot of that market are not open to these types of products. You know, there's a very small uh, percentage that love the products and, and are repeating their purchase. So we have to target and, you know, we want to be able for everyone and we target every, everyone and the majority of the consumers that are receptive to non out products, not just ours, but to non out products are, are from the same similar backgrounds. Uh, so for me, it has been a very difficult challenge in that you know, I don't represent my target consumer. You know, our target consumer is British or American woman between the ages of 25 to 40, you know, single or has a young family. And you know, there are a lot of brands whose founders come from that background and they're very vocal, vocal about that. So I, I think I'm, I'm probably pretty good at talking about the operational side and you know, some of our wins but in terms of representing the brand on social media. I rely on external sources, you know, marketing agencies or influencers to kind of build out that image that we're trying to convey, we're trying to portray. Um, and it is, is still a very big challenge because you want to hear that directly from the founder. So it's something that we're grappling and we're, we're still trying to figure out how to do it. But you know, our team is really small as well, just three of us. And so we're heads down focusing on execution and you know, landing accounts. And so we're right now relying on kind of external factors to build out that, that profile of the brand. I think, I mean, you raise a lot of 
really important points there. I think one of the things for me is one of the reasons why I have this podcast as a video podcast, even though I don't do a lot of promotion for the, for the, the video side of it on, on YouTube, is that I want to be seen. So I don't have this conversation very often because I think actions are more uh, impactful and more powerful than, than words. Uh, and I think it's really important for, for people like you and me uh, and other ethnic minorities within this space to make sure that we're seeing. Because mm-hmm. I think one of the dangers is that, you know, people often say that you need to see somebody like you to know that you can achieve what you want to achieve. Um, mm-hmm. And until we're more, vo- more visible, more vocal, um, it's harder for people to recognize that there are other people in their own communities, uh, whether they be black or Asian or, you know, from, from wherever, uh, that also live this lifestyle. Because I think it's, we, ru- we run the risk of assuming that people of different ethnicities aren't as interested in these drinks. But is mm-hmm. that because they don't see enough representation and they don't realize that these drinks are for them as well? Mm-hmm. much as in the way of, of many other things that we've all had to deal with, such as, you know, jobs and education and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and is it that the visibility of, of people like us will help more people go, actually, it's OK to be African and not want to drink. It's OK to be mm-hmm. Punjabi and not want to have a boozy wedding, you know, and, and to give people that opportunity to see that there are more people that look like me who live the way that I want to live. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I think it's so important that we find a way to to be more visible and to get on more panels and more boxes and yeah. such. And I think it's about how you, as you said, get, make that opportunity more visible to our communities. And I've been thinking about this a lot and it, it, it comes down to, well, my take on it is, you know, we come from first, second generation immigrants whose parents moved here, or maybe we moved here from different countries and you're just, you're just kind of surviving and getting through the system. You know, you're, you're, and I bring this term up quite a bit on, on other podcasts, you don't have that necessarily that, that safety net to fall back on, to take that risk, to say, I want to be an entrepreneur, you know, I want to quit my nine to five job and um, just do this full time. Um, that's a huge risk for, for anyone. What I find in, especially in the UK, in, in the FMB space, there's a lot of founders that come from, I'd say more comfortable backgrounds, <laughs> to be careful of what I say, but more comfortable backgrounds and possibly could take that risk because they have that safety net um, that they can fall back on if, if things fail. But, you know, for us, a lot of us are taking care of our parents. You know, we have you know, still upbringings where we're trying to make our, our mark in, in, in life and we just don't have that that safety net to fall back on if things fail. So we choose not to, to take that risk and follow a more, you know, more safe path, like being a, an engineer or a lawyer or a doctor going through the education system. So I think that might take another generation to to work itself out but we as founders can you know can showcase what we've done in this space and we're working with organizations in london to try to give back to the community you know working with sapphire community group i mentioned earlier in in south london where we're trying to give opportunities to those from these types of backgrounds underrepresented underprivileged backgrounds we've done a couple of internships now where we've giving them exposure to what a career in food, food and beverages is, is like. And we want to do more of that. Again, we're still, we're still quite small, but as we grow, we want to do more and more of that. And if other brands who have founders from minority backgrounds can, can do the same, I think slowly we can make a difference in this community. And as you said, it's all about visibility and making sure that we as ethnic minority founders are, are screaming just as loud as others. And I think you made a really interesting point about um, not shouting about your own achievements very much on places like LinkedIn or, or social media. Um, I post quite a lot uh, now, but I it's been a battle for me to get to the point where <clears throat> I felt like I could, particularly with LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is such mm-hmm. a, a, a corporate platform. And LinkedIn to me was always uh, sort of like the, the online version of, of the city. You know, it, it, to me, I thought it was like a really suited and booted uh, corporate landscape and I just didn't feel like I fit in if I'm if I'm telling the truth I just didn't think that people would want to see me or hear Mm -hmm. from me and so even now that I've been posting regularly there and in other places I still sometimes have to just almost force myself just to to press send and to to put those things out there and to to shout about things that I'm doing because as you said if you don't do it then no one else is going to do it for you but what I found is that once I do it 
then you'll find the people that will then support you no matter what. And, you know, and, and the comments that you get back, which are just blanket support and have nothing to do with, with anything other than you're doing a great thing and I want to see more of that. And then that inspires me to keep going and go, right, OK, I'm doing a good thing. You know, we're, we're showing something positive to everyone, not just people that look like us, but, you know, making that change without um, making it the purpose of what we're doing. But it, it is hard and it's not, you know, when you grow up as second generation it's not what you're taught to do you're not taught to go out and shout about yourself you're taught to just put your head down get on with what you got to do do your studies and get that mm -hmm. really boring job that you mentioned before <laughs> yeah yeah exactly right so i mean it, i think it will take time but you know us and and those like us are kind of at the forefront of this and it's up yeah. to us to kind of lead lead that movement yeah, amazing. You mentioned the uh, Sapphire Community Group. Is that what it's called? I'll, I'll, I'll... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So based yeah, in, I'll make sure in South London. In the show notes for people. Sure, no problem. Yeah, really great organization. They have an abundance of talent that are just looking for that opportunity to kind of showcase themselves. Um, so yeah, anyone feel free to, to reach out to them and, and access their pool of resources. Amazing, amazing. Thank you very much. Um, Avnish, it's been amazing chatting to you. Before I let you go, I've got mm -hmm. my um, last question, and I will ask you to, again to uh, share your website again. But my last question, which goes to everyone who comes on the show, um, because I'm all about spreading the love across Low No Nation and making sure people know about amazing drinks to try. And I love knowing what founders are enjoying. So mm -hmm. uh, before we press record, we were talking about this uh, freak weather we're having where it's 21 <laughs> degrees, but torrential downpour. Um, but imagine it's just warm weather and it's a lovely day and you and your lovely wife uh, are off to a barbecue at a, a friend's house. Other than the amazing range of Savile fantastic ready to drink mm -hmm. cocktails, what other low no or light drinks do you like to enjoy when you're choosing to drink less alcohol? I think I have to go back to the the original, um, the original pioneer in this space. I really love uh, Seedlip Spice ninety four. It's very simple. Just I love cardamom. I love the peppers. Just pour it with some full fat tonic on ice, and it's probably one of the, the better, more well rounded non alcoholic cocktails. That and it's just just so simple to make, so simple and clean. Um, but yeah, another recommendation or another favorite of mine is being an entrepreneur is stressful raising kids is stressful. So we need that relaxation. And I really enjoy uh, Three Spirits Nightcap as well. It's always on my shelf, just pour it over ice at night while working on emails till two in the morning or whatever we do crazy hours that we work. And it's just a nice way to just take a bit of a break. Yeah, yeah. You always need that, that little extra boost when you're uh, raising a business at the same time as raising children, you know, as <laughs> two jobs at once. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great recommendations. Thank you very much. Uh, and just for uh, just to remind people, if they want to go and find out more about you, more about the brand, they want to go and buy some amazing cocktails, remind us what's the website to send them to. Yeah, so head to savill.com, S-A-V-Y-L-L.com. Uh, amazing. I'll make sure that goes in the show notes. Adnish, thank you so much for your time. Have a great day. Thanks. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks, Denise. <laughs>